Right. Uh, I'm delighted uh, this afternoon to be talking to Elizabeth Bronfen, uh, Professor of English at the University of Zurich, about her brand new book, Serial Shakespeare, uh, an infinite variety of appropriations in American TV drama. Um, it, is a, it is not simply an analysis of Shakespearean adaptations or influence, but approaches via a concept called cross-mapping, uh, eking out the cultural unconscious uh, and underscoring the reciprocity between these contemporary serials and the 400-year-old plays. So we'll start at the beginning, Elizabeth, and, and basically say, how did this project come about? Well, I think that there were two beginnings for this project. One is that I've always wanted to write a book about Shakespeare, um, <laughs> and that I have always been teaching Shakespeare to my undergraduate students, um, but that a way of teaching Shakespeare to them has in fact been through um, contemporary television drama, because I noticed early on that um, along with chess games, which I then became quite fixated on, um, all these references to Shakespeare often, you know, just a sentence tossed here or a citation tossed there. And I thought, what, what would it mean if one looked at a set of um, these television dramas and for me it was important that they were finished as far as possible, not all of them, but I preferred if they had already been done. Um, and um, thought about them in relationship to the Shakespeare, which was in one way or another invoked, even if it wasn't an explicit adaptation, because this is what I was not interested in. I wasn't interested in the many BBC film versions we have of Shakespeare, nor was I interested in shows that were explicitly a rethinking of. And in fact, um, it was really The Wire, which I came to watch late. Everyone had already seen it. Once it was out on DVD, it became a classic. And I think one of the reasons why it became a classic was that was the first time that anyone really understood what those people were saying, including Americans, um, because you then had subtitles to kind of translate what they were saying. Um, and I came to it when it was done. For everyone, it was already over. And there I was just beginning to watch. And that's when I noticed that one sentence, heavy lies the head that wears a crown in reference to Henry IV. And I wasn't so much interested in comparing it with that set of history plays. And instead with a set of history plays I'm almost more fond of, namely the plays around Henry the um, VI um, and then um, Richard III. Um, and, it, it's, and, and so I became intrigued to see what happens if you kind of map a set of figures from the plays onto the set of figures in the show and to see where does it overlap and where does it not overlap and what does it mean that there are changes or differences. And so then of course you start noticing things. It's not just that he says heavy lies the um, head that wears the crown, but Marla at some point says, you know, I want to be wearing the crown or all the references to sovereignty on the part of the um, of those gangster lords. That was really the beginning of this project. And then really spending time reading the two texts against each other because that also meant not just asking how do we see Shakespeare differently if we read him in relationship to the wire, but also how do we see the wire differently and the battle for power, the struggle to survive, the rivalry, the, the destruction also, because this too is a war, only in this case a war of drugs rather than the war of the roses. How do we see that differently if we look at it in relationship to Shakespeare? Right. Um, I mean, the, the title, you know, Serial Shakespeare, in, in what way is seriality important uh, to your discussion of Shakespeare's cultural survival and an afterlife? Right, so Serial Shakespeare means two things. <clears throat> it means, on the one hand, the serialization of Shakespeare, that is to say, the repeated return of Shakespeare in TV dramas and here um, the fact that it's not just that he comes over and over again in the one TV drama and the next and the third, but also that within these individual dramas. Another example, for example, would be Westworld, where you have this one host who quotes Shakespeare and he quotes Tempest, um, King Lear, and um, at some point also Romeo and Juliet. So it's within the show Westworld, at least the first two seasons, that Shakespeare appears serially. But there was another dimension to what I was interested in, and that is um, many years ago, um, a Shakespearean critic, Jan Cott, once said about Shakespeare, it's as though 
once you look at his entire works, it's as though he had only written three or four plays and he kept repeating them over and over again, always in a new key. So there's a, a form of seriality in the Shakespearean plays themselves. You could say that there's a whole set of plays that revolve around the whole question of sovereignty, the legitimacy and the legitimation of sovereignty. There's a whole set of plays that revolve around, I don't know, a woman who's repudiated, seems to be dead and then returns, or that revolve around ghosts coming and bringing in information and taking away information. So that was the seriality I was also interested in. And in my own book, what that then meant was that um, while I chose my television shows in order to cover really different areas, that is to say, to cover um, more the histories, uh, to bring in the dark comedies, to bring in the, the tragic and the romances, there are certain plays that keep returning because those are the ones that make more sense for TV drama. Hmm. I mean, it's, it, this book could not have been written, um, say, two, dec two decades ago, maybe, maybe even a decade ago, as, as the multi-platform nature of television has produced all of these series lately, and I'm, we're talking about Deadwood, The Wire, Beat, Westworld, The American. I mean, do you, do you do you think you could have written something along the lines of seriality 10, 15 years ago? I think I could have written something about the seriality that's internal to Shakespeare 10 or 15 years ago, but I think what has become so interesting looking at Shakespeare in relationship to these TV dramas now is um, the fact that he really shows up everywhere and also in odd places. Um, once I embarked on this project, of course, I was giving lots of talks and people were then saying, oh yeah, but have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? So one person said, have you looked at billions? And I was like, okay, billions, this is about this um, rogue um, Wall Street investment banker and a very obsessed DA uh, who wants to take him down. And I thought, yeah, that kind of makes sense but I hadn't remembered anything. So I um, looked at it again and there wasn't a single bit of um, Shakespeare in the entire show. I was really tracking everything that sounded vaguely Shakespearean. I kind of typed to the computer because that's how I found all the quotes in Westworld. Um, and then, you know, you, but nothing came. And yet there was this one moment where um, uh, one of the guys from the DA's office is interviewing um, a friend of uh, and a buddy of this rogue investment um, banker and um, the investment bank says something that sounds terribly lofty and the investigator says oh is that Shakespeare and he says no Stephen King but just the same so you know there's something called Shakespearean and um, another show Succession would be um, an example Succession does actually quote Shakespeare now and then but what I was also interested in is not just that they pick up on what we now call quotable Shakespeare, because they're assuming that people will recognize this, but that people have the feeling this is Shakespearean. And then when you ask them, what do you mean? They can't really tell you. Some people say mm, it's the lofty language. Some people will say, oh, there are many characters on stage. Some people will say, well, it's about love, death, revenge, desire. I mean, as though Shakespeare was the only person who'd written about that. So I was also interested in what this Shakespearean means for the viewers, for the critics, and you see, I am assuming for the people doing the scripts and even for the creators, because um, one of the things we mustn't um, forget is that many of the people in television drama now are people who actually studied <laughs> with people like me, um, who studied cultural analysis, who did art history, who did English studies at USLA, at Leeds, at London, and who are actually taking their reading and their knowledge of Shakespeare and then turning it into a contemporary script. So I think this is something that's really happening now. I think that television drama is a place where that can happen more easily because you have much more time to develop characters. Um, and then, of course, one could say, if one then looks back at the production of Shakespeare's plays in his time, this was popular culture. This was not high art. I think that's what people sometimes forget because it has become high art for us. But in fact, it fed a very similar interest at the time than that television drama feeds today. So I think it's a very contemporary um, question. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you mentioned this uh, before, but it is not a book about adaptation in any straightforward sense. Instead, you, you approach uh, with this idea of cross-mapping. Can you, can you expand on, on, on the idea of cross-mapping? 
Well, cross mapping is really something that I have come up with as a as a kind of term for a type of reading I do. And it's not purely associative. It's not like I think, oh, well, that opera is interesting and I'm going to read that together with that play. There have to be there has to be some connection. And I, I take this uh, uh, idea really from the American philosopher Stanley Cavell, who was really the first person to do something like this. He gave I studied with him at Harvard. Um, and he gave this big um, undergraduate lecture class where he would start out with Plato and end up with um, what he loved most, the film comedies of the 30s and 40s. And he would love to compare um, a classic film comedy like um, um, Philadelphia Story with Midsummer Night's Dream. And of course, most probably those people were educated people they probably knew Shakespeare was there a direct connection no but he was tracking certain themes and in his in, in his case falling asleep having certain um, uh, uh, um, insight and then waking up both what do you forget when you wake up and what do you remember as that which connects um, the Shakespeare comedy with this American sophisticated comedy with Cary Grant and um, and uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn from 1941. And what he would say is the point for him is not to say that the one fits perfectly with the other, but rather having found a connection, a thematic connection or a certain constellation that is the same, what does it mean to read the one in terms of the other? And so this is really what I'm interested with cross mapping, finding texts, this can be Shakespeare and television, this could be, I've done this before with um, Shakespeare, um, opera and film, this could be many different forms. I'm particularly interested in earlier texts and contemporary texts, because I'm also interested in the way certain cultural knowledge continues to stay with us or resurfaces at certain historical moments. And so basically saying there is a, I'm discovering a relation between these two, what are the consequences of reading those texts for this similarity. And it's really, on the one hand, it's a way of focusing your reading. That is to say, you then start noticing things you wouldn't have noticed if you're reading, let's say, um, a, play, a play or a television series for genre or for film techniques or for certain themes. So that's the one thing that you, you, you just get a richer reading of these texts. But the other thing, and this is what I meant with historical, I am very concerned with that. That is, the, that is to say the idea that um, culture is never a finished process, but that certain issues come again and again, that we're haunted by them, or that we have to retrieve them in a particular contemporary moment in order to articulate something. And so I, I would say the, the real connection for me between these Shakespeare plays and these television drama is really when Shakespeare writes, he's writing at the turn into modernity around um, 1600, something has changed. You know, you don't have to just invoke Foucault for that. You can invoke many different um, authors, but it was it's very clear that there's a shift in political thinking and the thinking of the subject and the thinking of, um, in, in, in interchanges between people, people and their sovereign desire, etc. Um, because it's no longer the medieval period, but aspects of the medieval world um, order continue to um, resonate. So it's a moment of interim. Nothing is yet fixed. It's not the 17th century. Um, it's it, or rather it's more moving into, but it's not the end of the 17th, early 18th century. And I have the feeling that at the end of the 20th into the 21st century, we are living in a similar kind of interim. Whether you want to call postmodernism or late modernism, whichever way you want to use, it seems to me that that this is on its way out or has already finished. Something new is in the process of becoming, but we don't quite know what it is yet. So it's another interim phase where there's an opening. Um, and, and, and to be more precise in Shakespeare's plays, what then became clear to me, because of course I was also thinking about how am I going to finish this book? You know, what, what closure do I find, especially for television series? Because you see the whole television series, it could go on forever. I mean, at some point at the end of The Sopranos, Tony Soprano looks up and you don't know, is has the guy who's going to shoot him just walked in? Um, at the end of The Wire, you know, Marlowe's out, but someone new is going to come. At the end of The Americans, they're back in Moscow and anything is possible. What is going to happen to page? So this open-endedness that something has been set up and something new will come. 
and I think once you look at Shakespeare that way, especially because then I started reading him backwards, starting with the latest plays, going back to the first to really see how often he's recycling himself as part of this internal seriality. Most Shakespeare plays open on a, a strangely open and on a strangely open note. At the end of all of those tragedies, nothing has been resolved. It's just a new leader. At the end of the histories, yes, we know that ultimately this will lead to Elizabeth I, but and with the comedies as well, there's so few of them, in fact, none of them are really predicated on plausible marriages that um, you have the sense that something has dramatically been resolved to a certain degree, but only insofar as opening up something again. So it's this idea of interim, not just that the play is an interim between our having gone into the playhouse and walking out of the playhouse, but that the play, the plays themselves point to phases of interim, asking ourselves if we think about certain problems, certain constellations, certain issues now, what could we do in order to make that happen in the future? So this is another thing that becomes really interesting with cross mapping when you're looking at two texts that, that bring together, bring into conversation two um, different historical times. It's to uh... A slightly more specific question. Two of the chapters in the book involve discussions of uh, Amer American television drama and the way it has envisioned, um, if not anticipated, a first female president, uh, which I think is quite timely at the moment. Well, it's particularly timely because what I was um, concerned with, and I have to admit I wrote this because I, I'm perfectly willing to admit this, I was a great Hillary Clinton fan. And I do feel that 2020, you know, we might ask ourselves with all her faults, did we really have to go through the Trump period? Why was that necessary? Why couldn't we have just chosen her who was so clearly a better candidate 2016? So there are a lot of anxieties about women in power that became very, very clear when Clinton was running. And that was really what inspired me um, to look at not just, oh, because it's astonishing, once you start looking, you find it's not just House of Cards, it's not just Scandal, actually it starts much earlier with Commander-in-Chief and goes all the way to now Madam Secretary, where in the last season she too becomes a President of the United States. So you can really say that for almost 20 years American television has demonstrated this to us, and, um, and in, in many different genres, everything from really bad things like, I mean, bad, really very generic thrillers like Prison Break and 24 to something more serious um, like Madam Secretary, which is more of a female melodrama or Scandal, also very melodramatic. Um, and so it was not just that I noticed that they have, television has been thinking about this, but then I did, you know, a little chart what are they Republican or Democratic? Uh, how do they get into power? And that's really interesting. It's very, um, it's very even between a Republican and Democrat, but never either they get into power because they were the vice president and then the president dies or is murdered off by the wicked woman, or um, they, if they are elected, then they don't stay elected because they become corrupted. So you almost never, commander in chief that had only one, um, what one uh, season and in fact she moved up because the president dies and M Madam Secretary even there although she is then elected she has to be re-elected again so it's it's the uncertainty the open-endedness there's never um, we have not seen anything that has a woman behind this desk who is plausible, who is reasonable, who has who is absolutely legitimate in the way that Morgan Freeman was president in a catastrophe movie. Or of course the template is really West, West Wing, where this is a good, um, a, a reliable, uh, someone who has legitimacy. And so then I thought, now let's see what happens if we look at um, a similar tip, tip, um, a kind of typology for the queens in Shakespeare. And that is again, very, very interesting because we know all the anxiety that people in the early modern period felt for this queen in power. And, and, and she really embodies the distinction between the natural body of the king and the symbolic body of the king because she stages both. She says, you know, I have the heart of a woman, but the, but the I don't know, the muscles and the force of a man. So, I mean, she really stages the two sides that she both is in the symbolic power of a man 
um, and that she, you know, there are wonderful anecdotes about how when she was old, um, she would um, have ambassadors come into her courtroom with her naked breast hanging out of her blouse, just to indicate, you know, I am fully aware that I'm here, the feminine embodiment of masculine sovereign power. Um, so, but she was a figure of anxiety. She was never legitimate. And people did not see her as legitimate, but partially because there were the Catholics that didn't want her, partially because there was so much infighting in her court. And so I wanted to see what does Shakespeare do with that? And then you get a very similar picture to the one that we have um, for the uh, female presidents, namely a fascination, um, which can go from particularly sane, cautious, careful, prudent, like the princess in um, Love's Labour's Lost, all the way to the really wicked ones in the tragedies. And then in between character that I'm very fond of, um, um, Queen Margaret in the um, first of the Henriades, who is kind of a foreigner because she's a woman, but also because she's French and who gets um, involved in the party politics and she can't help but because she has to ultimately also fight for her son and that's kind of the position that those queens in, in Shakespeare that are in that position Cleopatra would be another one of those because she's considered foreign but also very erotic um, and splitting um, between the, um, the eroticized Alexandria and the very paternal um, patriarchal Rome that then allowed me to rethink what would otherwise have been a very simple formula for the presidents, namely saying Americans don't like female voices and are nervous about women in power. Once you read them as, as embodiments of these issues, around these anxieties, as well as desires that female sovereignty already raised in Shakespeare's times and thus has put on stage since then over and over and over again. Yeah, that allows for a more, um, I would say more nuanced um, reading. Mm -hmm. And um, all I can say is television drama, if we take this seriously, um, the way Krakawa, Siegfried Krakawa wrote about Weimar cinema, saying that Weimar cinema unconsciously anticipated what would happen in Germany in the 30s. So if you, if you say that there is this kind of cultural imaginary that anticipates something, then one can say not only what has proven again 2020, because we must not forget there were over five women who wanted to become president, not one of them was um, selected by the Democrats who voted. They wanted Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders, but primarily Joe Biden. They didn't want Elizabeth Warren, they didn't want um, a Klobuchar, and they didn't want Kamala Harris. It was only as vice president that she can now sparkle next to the old sage, lone fighter Biden. So it's not like Americans have yet learned anything from their television shows. However, what we do know is that women get into power by being vice presidents. And I think many people having these television scripts in their mind are now suddenly seeing, ah, but that's a possibility. We didn't vote for her, but then maybe she moves in and then we might vote for her again. So this was kind of what I got intrigued with um, by mapping these two sets of texts um, onto each other. I, lo I look forward to all the claims of illegitimacy, you know, the, the unlegitimate, un <laughs> illegitimate, the unlegitimate un presidency. Of, uh, exactly. Um, of all the, the conversations you propose um, in the book, um, the one between the spy thriller, The Americans, which I haven't seen, and, and, and I remember you telling me out in Stratford how much you loved it. Um, and the, 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 so between The American and, and comedies like Twelfth Night and The Miss Summer Night's Dream, it's only tan tangentially predicated on any explicit Shakespearean reference. What, what is the connection or connections that you're making there? So, I mean, the, the, the way I developed the book was to start with a show, Westworld, which very explicitly quotes Shakespeare and does so several times. Then, and, and as does Wire at least once, and then moving farther and farther and farther away. Um, and the Americans, this is pure conjecture on my part, but the, the, the intuition here was to look at this show, which takes place in the 80s. So we know the end of the show is going to be 1989, which is to say the end of the Cold War. And that means the end of whatever it is that these Soviet spies who have um, 
uh, disguise themselves as Americans. Um, whatever they're doing in Washington, that will be over. Not to say that there aren't any more spies there, but this particular genre of spying will be over. So it's it, they're, they're kind of looking towards an end. That's the first point we have to know. And the second point is that although they're very tortured people, they're constantly putting on different disguises. They put on, he puts on beards, different glasses. She's always wearing new wigs. She has an amazing array, not just of wigs and jewelry, but also clothes. So she's constantly a new person. And that's why the Americans really needs a whole set of not real Americans, but the idea of an American that these two Soviets, by the way, played by an American actress and a Welsh <laughs> actor, yes. the, the, the performance of Americans that they can put on. Well, I mean, what is that? That is so close to what um, Shakespeare's uh, comedies of mistaken identity and particularly Twelfth Night is about. That is to say, this is carnival. Admittedly, it's a dark carnival. But again, if we rethink Twelfth Night in terms of this, we realize how dark and how cruel Twelfth Night actually is. The point with Twelfth Night is we know it, the carnival will end. And we see that these, 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 in that case, it's just Viola cross-dressed as a boy, but then also Malvolio dressing up in order to please his countess. Um, <clears throat> how much this is, and, and particularly also the clown Festi, who says, you know, I am and I'm not, and this is all madness. Um, how the carnival is all about trying out different identities, which have to do with destabilizing who you are. And that's very much one of the aspects of the Americans over and beyond um, the um, idea of it being a spy um, thriller. And I then did test this on some undergraduates at Barnard. And I said, well, what about if we thought about this in terms of Midsummer Night's Dream? Because they're same thing, you know? They, 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 they also um, perform different roles. Why? Because in Midsummer Night's Dream, you get this love juice, which is put into the eyes of, of, of you know, little love drops into Titania's eyes and into the eyes of the male lovers. And then that makes you think about something. What, what is it that is happening in the Americans? Well, there is love juice or magic juice there as well, only there it's called ideology. And so it's very clear, they're seeing everything, the, the, the spies, but also the counter spies from the FBI, they're seeing everything through drops, namely the drops of ideology, be this, we have to defend Soviet uh, va values of the world against the American way of life, or vice versa, we have to defend the American way of life against all odds. And I think this works um, for this show because um, the, the, the show itself, the creator did once work, I think for the CIA, um, really is interested in showing the incredibly negative effects of ideology. Because at the end of the show, you know, so many people are dead and the, our main spies are disillusioned. And so there's this other thing, which I think is so typical for Shakespearean comedies um, and uh, particularly the Americans, it all moves not just towards 1989. I mean, they, they leave America before 89, but it's very clear. This is the summit where Gabachov um, is already debating with uh, Reagan the possibility of detente. Um, and they end up in Moscow and it's a form of waking up. And this is, a, this is such a crucial point for the end of the comedies. What does it mean to wake up from a carnival? Mm -hmm. So it was more, so here it was really an intuition or rather a speculation, similar constellation of characters, similar thematic concerns, what happens if we look at those in relationship to each other and notice the darkness in the carnival spirit for Shakespeare, but also realize the kind of liberties and the theatricalities involved in the way that 20 years later or almost 30 years later, um, uh, um, the, the people who made the Americans were rethinking what were those 80s like? Because of course, 89 changed everything, you know? That was the end of the bipart, part, the, the Cold War, um, communism here, free world there, that structured the world so clearly. And now we have a, a diff different axes that we have to deal with, so different kind of confusion. There was also this, th that's another, I mean, for us, the Cold War also was a form of dark carnival. Yeah. Um in general, uh, what, what do you think is at stake in the reading you offer? Uh, how does our understanding of, of Shakespeare change? And what do we discover about these television dramas? Um, I would say what 
our our reading of Shakespeare doesn't necessarily change. But once again, I mean, this is something that a lot of critics writing in the field of Shakespeare studies, adaptation studies, and also digital Shakespeare, because there is a lot of work on Shakespeare memes and other forms of digital uh, refigurations or appropriations of Shakespeare. I think what um, what we notice, this is almost horribly banal, but he really is not just the age of his time, but all times, how we can still tap into, or I would even say how he still to a certain degree haunts us because he's still his plays. I mean, we shouldn't say he because we don't even really know what that is, but his plays are so adaptable. And I think they're so adaptable because it is able, we are able not just to take a play out of its historical context and then to reapply it to problems we have today, which is why, I mean, people these days are even writing books, something called Shakespeare and Trump. I mean, it's like the, Trump being the only president, by the way, who never quoted Shakespeare. Everyone, even Bush quotes Shakespeare. So it's not just that you can take them and apply them to so many other things, um, but they have a life of their their own. Um, and that life of their own is the is, is the part that interested me. It's almost like just taking bits and pieces and seeing how vibrant they then become uh, for giving voice to articulating, describing, understanding something that is a cultural concern at the moment. Um, and I do also think, though, that we will see the plays differently. I think the tendency now, for example, is to see those comedies, especially something like um, much Ado About Nothing or Measure for Measure in a far darker light than they, they would have been seen in the 19th century. And um, for the television shows, what is gained, and I have something at stake here, obviously not all television drama, but some television drama is really excellent. The, the scripts are excellent, the acting is excellent, and they really touch the questions of our times in a way that I would say continues to be true for whatever performance of Shakespeare we have. So yes, of course, it does also have to do with cultural um, authority that they, they that we that I'm kind of, by virtue of Shakespeare, ascribing to these television shows. Um, and there I'm interested in how they pick up on certain thematic concerns and constellations, but also what they do differently. So, you know, when do characters not have to die? When is tragedy not an absolute necessity? Um, when do you have more characters where in Shakespeare it's just one character or vice versa. So I think it also allows us to think, if, if, if we take the seriality of Shakespeare's, if we take that seriously and say, yes, indeed he's constantly rewriting plays, uh, always in a new key based on what is it, we could say we can, we are continuing with that. We're kind of rewriting Shakespeare. We're giving, in, we're, we're adding to that seriality. It's, right, I, I, we're out of time actually, but I, I wanted to say that it's it's Cyril Shakespeare is a is a, an elegant um, erudite um, uh, investigation of Shakespeare's spectral presence, which is I think it's the the, 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 the term from Derrida, isn't it, that you quote in the book. But it's a wonderful book. Uh, it's going to be um, th th this uh, video is going to be hosted on our website, and uh, and it's and you'll be able to see exactly where to order the book from, or tell your library to order the books. It's still in hardback at the moment. But uh, Elizabeth, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for a wonderful book. And thank you, Matthew, for doing this talk. My pleasure.